am John Rotanti, and this is my investing life, where I interview the investors I admire most to learn about their investment process and philosophy. Today, I am speaking with Marcelo Lima from Heller House. Marcelo is the founder and managing partner of Heller House. Over the past three years, Marcelo's fund has generated 15.3% annualized returns compared to the MSCI All Country World Index, which generated 7.3% returns. In other words, over the past three years, Marcella has generated 8% alpha or market outperformance per year. Last year, I published an article about Marcella in which I call him one of the best, and I meant every word of it. Marcelo is one of the most impressive thinkers and stock pickers I have come across. So let's find out how Marcelo is able to achieve this outperformance for his investors. Marcelo, welcome. Please tell us about Heller House. John, uh, with that kind of introduction, it's really hard to live up to it, but uh, thank you for the kind words and thank you for having me back. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, at Heller House, our mission is really to deliver investment excellence to our investors. And, and the way we do this is first by having this very strong alignment of interests where, you know, my family and I were the largest investors in the partnership. And then our goal is to, uh, is to compound our wealth over the long term. And we do that by having a, a strong owner, owner's mentality, by owning businesses that are disruptive innovators. And now, you know, you might ask, why is disruptive innovation important? Now, imagine we're back in the 1800s and we're investors in canal transportation companies, for example. That was a thing and it was huge. And you and I say, you know what? We're doing super well. We're making all this money. We don't have to worry about technology. But then along come the railroads. They completely decimated the canal companies, made them totally obsolete. And, you know, I chose the beginning of the Industrial Revolution because that's when it started. But you see this pattern happening over and over again. And today we're experiencing this across so many areas. So unless you're an investor who understands the process of disruption and you're attuned to the latest technologies, you might end up investing in buggy whips without even realizing it. So we really try to identify these technological shifts, which create technology adoption curves. Some recent examples include the adoption of the internet, smartphones, cloud computing. They start at zero adoption and they grow over time and then identify exceptional businesses riding those adoption curves. And to do this well, you need a combination of skills. You need to be a good financial analyst and understand that. So how these companies will create value over time. You need to really understand the technology well. And then you also need to understand corporate strategy and company culture, because if you're owning these businesses for a decade or more, those factors are incredibly important. So, you know, we have an incredible group of high net worth individuals and institutional investors who've joined us at Heller House as investors. And in a nutshell, that's what we do. Awesome, Marcelo. So would you say that your stock picking philosophy is investing in these innovative disruptors that are on these accelerated growth curves? Is that how you would describe it or, or, or another way? That's right. We just we try to identify the best companies that have uh, developing moats that are taking advantage of these adoption curves. Awesome, Marcelo. The last time we spoke, you said you like to invest in companies that are in a state of perpetual beta. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, it's funny because I was actually, I read this book uh, years ago and I was recently rereading this chapter. Uh, you know, beta is, and I'll tell you what book it is, but beta is this term uh, where you have a product that you're still testing and perpetual beta is a phrase from this great book called super forecasting. And it's this idea that you're, you're never quite done. You're always applying a beginner's mind to the problems that you're facing. You're always improving. You have a growth mindset and you're never satisfied. You're always subjecting your assumptions to criticism and examination. So that's what perpetual beta means. And it's something that we look for in the culture of our companies and obviously something that uh, I also apply to my thinking as well. Perfect segue, because now I wanna ask, uh, ask you about uh, management and culture. The last time that we spoke, you also said that you were overweight corporate culture and management teams. What did you mean by that? Yeah. So. You know, uh, many people use uh, heuristics or mental shortcuts to make decisions. 
So for example, some investors might look primarily at an earnings multiple as a starting point. And my view is that uh, things that cannot be easily quantified are still incredibly important, especially if you're the owner of a business over many years. And among those things, I think culture and the quality of the management teams are very, very important. So I put a lot of weight on, the, on those factors when I'm considering an investment. You know, business is really hard uh, and someone is always trying to outcompete you, always trying to eat your lunch. And so having a great culture and leadership is crucial in the normal course of business, but it's really life or death in difficult times. And every business, even the greatest ones will go through those difficult times. So you really want to have a fantastic team with a great culture running the show. For sure. How do you um, how do you narrow down your investing universe, and how large is your investing universe? Yeah, so the universe is is quite big, uh, and it keeps getting bigger because we are going through so many different technological shifts right now, and that naturally creates what I call this Cambrian explosion of interesting businesses. Everybody competing to find out what combination of business model, go-to-market strategy, et cetera, will create the next winner. And so our goal then is to go through these, these businesses systematically, understand them, and then find the ones that have the best characteristics, all these factors that we talked about, culture, management team, best customer acquisition strategy. It's really a very holistic approach, but it is a process of trying to drink from a fire hose and then cool it down to a more manageable number of companies. Shifting gears slightly, what is your portfolio management strategy? How many stocks do you typically own? Uh, what is the size or weighting of a typical starter position? And then what is the size or weighting of a typical uh, max position? Yeah, so you know, I'd like to talk about some general principles that I strongly believe in. Uh, there is evidence um, over uh, long periods of time that, that stock returns are very highly skewed. So what that means is it, there's, a, there's an analysis that's been done that over the past 90 years, for example, uh, there's uh, hundreds of, uh, sorry, thousands, tens of thousands of listed stocks in the US over that period, but only 4% of listed stocks delivered all the net wealth if held over that 90 year period. And the other 96% actually delivered really, really bad returns. Uh, one way to interpret this result is that you, we have this Darwinian jungle of, of businesses that through mutation, selection, uh, amplification, end up generating these outlier uh, results. However, as we, as we mentioned, right, during these technological shifts, you have an explosion of new businesses. So you do really have to cast a wider net and perhaps have a more, more diversified portfolio at first. And then as the process of evolution unfolds, you can add more wood behind the arrow to those businesses that are turning into winners and, and then call the losers from your portfolio because it's very hard um, ahead of time to tell who's going to be uh, the winner in a new category of software, for example, a new category of technology. And so you, the same way your companies are adapting over time, you have to adapt your portfolio over time as well. So... You know, I think position sizing is something that is very uh, personal. We tend to have about 30 positions. It's very top heavy uh, because, and that's an outcome of the performance of, of the businesses, or sometimes it's an outcome of just having more conviction. Uh, and as far as holding cash, you know, I'm not a big fan of holding cash. I would rather access our investor base to raise additional capital when we need it. Awesome, Marcelo. We're 10 minutes into this interview and I've heard two terms I've never heard before, Cambri Cambrian explosion and Darwinian jungle. So I am loving this uh, so far. Um, so we talked about you run a fairly concentrated portfolio of about 30 stocks, don't hold, hold a lot of cash. How long do you typically research a new idea before you have enough conviction to decide to buy the stock? Yeah, so so that's um, it. Really depends on on the business. If, if there's some, if it's something that you have uh, a very high level of overlap, or you can you have a lot of transfer learning that you can apply from other similar businesses, it's obviously going to be a slower, uh, a shorter process. 
if it's something completely new, a new category, something you're unfamiliar with, you really have to go dig deep and understand sort of the background of the industry. Why is this, you know, new organism being formed, right? Why is this, why is this animal in front of me? What does it do and, and what's behind it? Uh, you know, our process is really to try to understand the, uh, the, the business and its DNA um, better than anybody else and, and really get a feel for the company's culture. And, and today that's easier than it used to be, right? Uh, you know, if you think about when I, was, uh, when I was starting out, the big advice was read all the filings. And of course, you still have to read the filings, but today you have a lot more tools. You've got YouTube, you've podcasts, Twitter. Uh, and then also an integral process, I think, is really visiting the company and attending, in our case, we attend developer conferences, really try to get our hands dirty with the product, talk to customers, find out who the competitors are, you know, why is this company winning and why will it, why will it continue to win in the marketplace? That's very important to understand. I was going to ask you, what does your research process look like? But I think you just sort of told us you, um, you said you read the filings, but you also look at YouTube videos with the CEO. You, you go to, you listen to podcasts, you go to developer conferences, you try to try out uh, the software or the technology that you're investing in. Um, so part of the research process uh, is valuation. And so my question on valuation is, do you build models and focus on discounted cash flow or DCF valuations? Or do you think about valuation using some other methods such as PE ratios or free cash flow yields or, or whatever? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, valuation is extremely important, right? Uh, if you, you can buy the most wonderful business in the world, if you pay too high a price, you're not going to see a return. Um, and of course, uh, all of us probably in this, in this, uh, in this uh, broadcast today have a memory of, of 2000 internet bubble. And then of course, a lot, if you bought the stock at the bubble, you might not have seen the peak for another 20 years. So it's, it's very important. Uh, you know, on the topic of models, uh, I, I'd like to say that I, I build models. Uh, I, I know that my models are wrong, but I still like to use them as an exercise in really understanding what are the types of assumptions that I need to make, not only to justify a company's valuation today, but also with the path going forward, what's realistic going forward. And you know, I, I know my models are wrong for a variety of reasons, one of which is I can't forecast the company's growth rate 10 years into the future. Uh, and one example I like is imagine building a model of Amazon in 2005, a year before they launched AWS, which not only completely transformed Amazon, but unleashed a technological revolution, cloud computing uh, as a service, right? And really this, this whole utility model of computing. So, you know, Models are very important. Valuations are very important. I think DCFs are very useful. And you, uh, I, I don't, I'm not a big believer in starting with a multiple because there's a lot that's built into that multiple. You really have to build the model in detail. We could talk more about that. But um, I think that the model has to be used in conjunction with all these other factors, the more intangible factors that we talked about as well. Yeah, I love that. I love, I, I love how you, I think the idea is, Modeling is useful. It's it's maybe even necessary, but at the same time, it's really hard to model optionality in some of these growth businesses that that you invest in and that we're going to talk about here in in, in a second. Um, last time we spoke, once again about a year ago, um, you said that about not about you said 100% of your portfolio was invested in businesses that were predominantly software businesses. Is that still the case today? And if so, why? Yeah, so it is still the case. And I think the reason is, you know, I continue to find a lot of opportunities, not only in our current portfolio, we see our businesses developing, introducing new products, et cetera, but also in new businesses that I'd like to add to the portfolio uh, at the appropriate time. You know, software has all these interesting characteristics that, that I really like. So uh, there's enormous secular tailwinds, uh, which these adoption curves behind pushing uh, the, the adoption of software forward, very high returns on invested capital, as we know, enormous opportunities to keep reinvesting capital in at attractive returns into the future. And, and 
uh, these companies are in markets that are enormous today, and those markets themselves are growing. And that's because we live in a world where it's very easy today to reach the entire globe. And, and software is a very leveraged business model for that reason, right? We have these public clouds and billions of people connected to the internet. And you can launch a business and get enormous global scale very quickly. And that's something that wasn't possible 20 years ago. So it's just a very interesting uh, a, a pond in which, in which to fish for us. Awesome. Um, so there are several software companies with a SaaS business model that have all of the things you just mentioned. They have high gross margins, high, high recurring revenue, very, very, very fast top line growth high returns on invested capital, and the potential for very high free cash flow margins at maturity. But they're currently trading at price to sales multiples of 20 times or 30 times or 50 times. Are these optically high valuations justified? <laughs> Uh, you know, first I'll make a general comment on multiples and then a specific uh, answer to your question. I think, you know, I feel that multiples are a little bit abused, as I, as I mentioned. You know, they, they really should be the outcome of a very careful and considered bottom-up model of how the company makes money. So, for example, you know, company, uh, if it sells software on a per seat basis, you really want to know, okay, well, how many seats uh, can it sell? What is the revenue per seat? What are the drivers of growth uh, of those two factors? Uh, what does the company's cost structure look like today? What can the cost structure look like in the future? How efficient is customer acquisition? What are the unit economics? What's the payback period on that customer acquisition? Uh, so you really need to build the model from the bottom up and to, to get a feel for the economics of the business. And when you do that, and then you ask, uh, are these optical valuations justified? The answer is that you know, in some cases they are, and in some cases they're not. There's really a spectrum. And the companies are always moving along that spectrum, depending on their future growth rate and their development. Uh, you know, how much will they grow? Or can they invent new businesses that can really inflect their growth? Again, thinking back to that Amazon example in 2005. There's also uh, this concept of uh, the ambition of the management team and, and the culture. You know, a new invention like AWS, and I'm just building this as sort of a canonical extreme example just to make a point, but a new invention like AWS is much more likely to happen inside an organization that has the right culture and that growth mindset and ambition than let's say in an old school uh, business run by a professional manager that who's worried more about the quarterly dividend, right? So. You know, I think the, the short answer really is not to rely on multiples as much as to try to really do the work and understand and then build your model and then see what comes out of that model. What kind of multiple comes out of that model? That might be your shortcut. But if you if you do the work, you'll you'll really get this feel that the multiples sometimes are justified and sometimes they're not is really the answer. Uh, I love I love that answer. So so let's discuss some stocks. What is your investment thesis in Shopify? So Shopify, uh, you know, the, the company's goal is, is really to build this operating system for, for e-commerce. Um, and, you know, we, we like businesses that are positioned in a competitive way that makes it very hard to compete with them. Uh, so there are many companies competing with Shopify, don't get me wrong, but I, I feel that their strategy is really superior in, in a lot of ways. So for example, they protect uh, against low-end disruption by offering a free tier and by having very low prices. So very hard for somebody to come in and undercut Shopify on price. Uh, and so they also have this very low friction model, right? Anybody can join Shopify and start selling literally in minutes, whether you're a large merchant and there are some CPG companies that they have a chief marketing officer and they're literally, this is, these are true stories. They're sitting at home on the weekend. They're like, you know, I'd really like to test this out. And they swipe their credit card and they set up a store and, and they, they start this experiment as well as obviously very small merchants. Uh, Shopify also has this ecosystem of, of partners who help, uh, who help clients build stores. And when they do that, they get a cut of the revenues uh, of those clients over the lifetime that those clients are on Shopify. And that's a very powerful, let's say, 
builds a very powerful ecosystem around Shopify of, of partners who really want to help them succeed. And they also have a very uh, successful marketplace, kind of like the Apple App Store, where developers around the world will build apps that sit on top and, and work on top of your iPhone or your iPad. There's also an app store uh, for, uh, for Shopify, apps that really plug in and amplify the functionality there. And you know, the company really has, a, you know, everybody watching this probably knows, they have this very intense, focused, mission-driven culture that's really uh, all about turning entrepreneurs into successful merchants. So everything they do is about uh, improving conversion for the merchants, reducing friction for them and their customers. And you know, because it's a software-based company and software is really permeating everything around us, Shopify can really use that muscle to solve more and more problems. So one example is they recently created a, a business checking account with no fees that is purely software-based for their merchants. And they're building uh, software to enable installment paying at the checkout, uh, for example. And so that's an, an interesting example on the software side, but they're not, you know, uh, they're not um, afraid of getting their hands dirty on the, uh, on, on the physical side as well. They announced obviously uh, Shopify Fulfillment Network, which is uh, they partner with uh, third party warehouses to enable fulfillment. And then they bought a robotics company to, to automate that. Uh, so it creates this very powerful flywheel where you have more merchants, more data to inform Shopify's machine learning models, which helps improve their payments product, helps improve their uh, conversational bots, helps improve conversion for the merchants, lowers the cost to serve each merchant. And it becomes a snowball that after a certain tipping point, just how do you compete with Shopify, right? Unless they really screw up it's hard for somebody else to have a lower cost to serve merchants, better data, sort of a stronger flywheel. And so if they keep uh, executing, it really could become a much larger business. So I checked a couple of days ago, uh, their market cap is just 120, 130 billion. So that's the valuation the market puts on Shopify. Do you think Shop Shopify can double from here? You know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, this I think Toby deleted this tweet, but I think it was a couple of years ago, somebody said, I can't wait for Amazon to buy Shopify. And then Toby said, well, uh, I can't wait to buy Amazon. And you know, I think it was 2039 or 2029. I can't remember, but I'm like, wow, that's really ambitious. Uh, I like that. Uh, I, so 130 billion, uh, if, you, if you run a model on Shopify, which I have many times and with varying degrees of assumptions, et cetera, you can get, um, you know, low returns from here. You can actually get attractive returns from here. It's really li literally path dependent on, on what they do from here. Um, I do think that they, that the stock can double from here. The question is how long is it going to take? Right. And, and that's really a function of a lot of things. How many uh, merchants can they onboard? Uh, how quickly do those merchants then grow on Shopify? And, and by the way, Shopify, as you know, uh, there's this concept of GMV, gross merchandise volume. How many dollars flow through Shopify for all their merchants? They make about 2.6% on those merchants. So a company like Etsy, for example, is way higher than that. I think it's, I think it's low double digits, maybe 9%, 10%, something like that. Amazon is higher still. And of course, it, this is comparing apples and oranges because those are marketplaces that bring customers to you. But to the extent Shopify can keep uh, helping merchants solve more and more problems, they will be able to, uh, to develop the economics around that and, and get more dollars uh, from the merchants as well. And you know, there's an interesting idea that I think is underappreciated, which is this idea of reflexivity. So you know, there's, there's a lot of value, as we know, to being a public company compared to a private company, because if you're public, you have a higher profile, you can pay your employees in stock and reward them that way. You uh, also have currency for an acquisition. You can use your stock for an acquisition. Uh, but if you have a highly valued currency, you can also raise capital at, very low, at a very low cost. And by raising billions of dollars, which Shopify has done repeatedly to help fund the business, it also sort of, you know, with the right people behind that, which I think they do have the right people behind that, it can become uh, not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it can really help them fulfill their mission, right? Whereas if, uh, if it was a private company, it would be harder for them to, to raise capital, they would have a higher cost of capital, et cetera. So, 
there's there's some of that as well. Um, so the, the short answer is absolutely can double from here. The question is how quickly, and we just have to see what they do. Yeah, the thing I uh, the other thing I love about the Toby tweet is not only does it show he's ambitious and confident, but also very focused on the long term. Like he's in it, he's in it for the long game. Yeah, so, and they talked about building a company for the next hundred years, right? Exactly. The yeah. only other company I know that does that is Nestle, but you know, Nestle is already on its I don't know eighth or tenth CEO or something, and is growing very slowly. So, not that exciting. But, right. Uh, Shopify, it, it's pretty interesting. It is very interesting. Another interesting company and another Motley Fool favorite is Wix. Uh, what does Wix do, and why do you like it? Yeah, Wix is, um, as most people might know, the, it's a website builder. So, you know, it's, it's the largest competitor. The largest competitor in this space is WordPress. But WordPress, and I, I tried, I, I built our website, uh, hellerhs.com. I built that on Wix fairly recently. I tried doing it on WordPress, and it's actually pretty hard. Uh, they don't make it very easy. Uh, my, my previous version of the site was on WordPress, but I had... I had a professional do it for me and it was very hard for me to change it. I had a, I had admin rights. There was always trying to update some plugin and no new version of WordPress came out, click here to update. You never quite knew what was gonna work with what, whether you're gonna break the plugin. Uh, you really needed professional management to make it work. Wix just makes it incredibly easy. If you try to build a site on Wix, it's, it's just a huge pleasure and it's programmable. And, and it also has a marketplace with apps and everything. And they're always in, uh, introducing new features. So it's a, it's, there are parts of it that are more limited than WordPress. I have a big frustration with the functionality, for example, in, in the blog where you can't do some simple things. On the other hand, you can do some very powerful things and you can code. What I, so I have, I, I've written my own code to run parts of the website on Wix and that's super powerful. And so uh, the company has grown very quickly. The only other competitor now, uh, really, I think the, the, the ranking is sort of WordPress, Wix, and then Squarespace, which might be going public soon. Uh, but the team at Wix is really superb. They've built something very special, and it's really an incredible product. So I think if they keep executing well, uh, they, you know, the, sky's, the sky's the limit, so to speak, because it could, it could really, you could really see this becoming a much larger business. So Wix and Shopify both help small and medium-sized businesses grow and thrive. Do they compete with each other? Um, and why do you own shares of both of them if they do compete with each other? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, you might call it a Noah's Ark approach. <laughs> you, you don't really know who's going who's gonna to be the alpha predator uh, 10 years from now. They do compete with each other, but... I think that they approach the problems that they're trying to solve very differently. And also they attract different types of customers initially, at least. So Wix uh, is more of a content management system, let's say, where you want to expose your content. You might have a, a portfolio. Maybe you're a lawyer, a dentist. Uh, you want to have a blog, that sort of thing. Whereas Shopify is really more geared towards, I need a store. And, and I need a store that's very efficient, that has high conversion, that has integration with email marketing and uh, Facebook ads and all that sort of thing. Now, they do bump into each other because once you're on Wix, you can set up a store on Wix, right? You can take appointments. You can, so they do uh, uh, go into step on each other's turf. And I think that that's almost inevitable. You see that, that across a huge category of software. So, uh, but I do think it's plausible that let's say 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now, I think it's plausible that Wix ends up as the largest website builder in the world serving creatives of all types who maybe don't need a store as their first thing. And then Shopify ends up as the largest independent e-commerce platform for, for merchants who are really focused on being merchants. Awesome, Marcelo. Uh, so I want to move on to Slack which as we know has become a verb, people say Slack me. Uh, but my question is this, has Slack met its match with Microsoft Teams? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's the question on everybody's mind. And I think the media does a really good job of, of propagating this idea that Teams is killing Slack. So if you're an uninformed observer uh, and perhaps even a mildly informed observer, you might reach that conclusion. 
but you know, if you if you do some digging, you realize a few things. Well, first of all, you know, Teams is doing extremely well now, but the use case is very similar to Zooms, where it's primarily video. You know, and the fundamental innovation uh, of Slack is really creating this channel-based communication that's a replacement for internal email. It vastly improves internal collaboration inside companies. And the software has thousands of integrations with all the other software that companies use to run their businesses. So HR systems and document management systems, et cetera, all this stuff is really, really well integrated into Slack. So for large enterprises, their goal is to be you know, 2% of your IT budget that leverages and dramatically improves the other 98% of your spend. Um, now, talking about this channel-based communication, you know, Teams has a hard limit on that. You can't create uh, a, a certain number of channels uh, beyond what their limit is. And for large enterprises, they very quickly reach that limit. So you really literally have no choice. You, you've got to switch to Slack. And, and now what's interesting is that recently Slack built this thing called Slack Connect which allows, let's say you're an organization here, you've got Slack for your internal communications and organization B here with Slack for its internal communication. You can now create a, a tunnel between these two companies and a shared channel that's secure, has its own document retention policy. It's very complicated. It's got its own encryption keys. And it's, it's really created this enormous intercompany network effects where now you know, my business uh, is, is, uh, is, is happier if you are a Slack user and vice versa. So it creates this very interesting dynamic, right, for intercompany collaboration. It's really a game changer. It's a new feature. Customers so far absolutely love it. And it took Slack years to completely re-architect the software to make this happen because it's complicated. And it's not something that teams can do easily if they can do it at all. So uh, again, and then you look at Slack adoption, they're really growing fastest among the largest enterprise customers, all of whom are uh, Microsoft uh, Teams users. So really the evidence seems to be that these products maybe are complementary. You know, Slack integrates really well into Teams and Teams is really a skin for SharePoint files and can be used as a very good browser for SharePoint files. So. I think the summary is if you take the time to really understand Slack and what they're building, and, and again, same things we talked about, right? The, the company culture, the management team and all that, it's just very hard not to be excited about, about the company. And I think the size, if you look at the size of the business, what $18 billion market cap into um, a, a, a market, you know, Microsoft is the largest uh, enterprise software vendor and they're like 7% of total enterprise spend. And that's a trillion plus uh, company there's a lot of room for Slack to be much bigger in the future. I agree that it's a potential game changer. You know, internally company uh, employees will say Slack me to someone else internally, but soon I think we're going to have B2B Slack where businesses tell another business Slack me. Yeah. And so, yeah. And that's happening. Uh, you know, if you, if you listen to the last conference call, the last earnings call, they talk about that a lot where customers are, there's examples of, of companies, they want to do a better uh, support for their customers. And so they'll actually pay for the customer's seat on Slack so the customer can talk to them through these shared channels. They'll find probably a more elegant solution for that. There's also this emerging use case of sales. And so it turns out that selling, let's say you have this complex sale that you need to make that involves perhaps a lawyer, different parties, et cetera. You set up a shared channel and apparently the sale becomes a lot smoother and closings happen at a much higher rate through that shared channel. And so Stuart Butterfield said in the last call, he said, you know, it used to be buy Slack, get better collaboration. And now it can actually be buy Slack and increase your sales. And that's, that's a very interesting pitch. So this is a, a very new use case for a very new piece of functionality. So they're learning very quickly. And this is, by the way, uh, as an aside, John, a feature of these software as a service companies. They have a very tight feedback loop between introducing a product, getting the feedback and innovating, right? Whereas the old school business model of, you know, stamping, producing a widget in a factory, putting it out there on the shelf, trying to get feedback from the customer, it was very disjointed and it took a long time. So that's a very interesting world we live in today with these service businesses. It, it definitely is. Um... Moving on to digital payments, you own two of my favorite digital payment companies in PayPal 
and Square. Let's start with PayPal. What is your investment thesis for PayPal? Well, um, you know, it's, it's really, there's this concept in uh, startup investing called product market fit. And this is when your product is, uh, it, it's so good that the market just starts banging on your door for it. The phone is ringing off the hook. Your website just can't stay up because all the customers are flocking to it, et cetera. And, you know, there's nothing quite like that in public companies, but sometimes it's, it gets close. Uh, if you look at the last uh, quarterly earnings for, for PayPal, it was quite astonishing, right? The company's just firing on all cylinders. They had the strongest quarter in the company's history. And so overall, it's, it's a business that's ex executing very well and really availing itself of this opportunity uh, in digital wallets and P2P payments, um, that's person-to-person uh, -person payments, and eventually building, hopefully, a digital bank on your phone. So I, I, the way I see PayPal is really as a, a major disruptor of financial services, uh, a business that, again, they're executing very well. And if they can keep doing that, it could really become sort of this hub for an enormous amount of digital services that they can build on top of. And they already have the customer you know, on the phone there. You know, they already have the customer acquisition um, uh, engine working very well, as you know, through PayPal and Venmo. Yeah, for sure. And I think they have... 70 or 80 percent of the checkout button market share. Amazon checkout is second, but but PayPal is just the far, far, far and away leader. Uh, yeah, it what, increases conversion, as you know, right? So if you have if you have the button there on your checkout, it increases conversion. By the way, that's also true about Shopify with Shop Pay, right? Every time you reduce friction, these companies are a lot of them. A lot of the thesis is really about reducing friction. Apple Pay is incredible. I I love Apple Pay. You just like you go to a store. You just tap a button. You don't have to type in your, uh, my name, my address, all that stuff. It's just a big turnoff nowadays to have to do that. Shop Pay makes that super easy. And as you as you as you mentioned, PayPal as well. So um, yeah, so that's that's super attractive. And now they bought Honey, which provides more data to close the loop and and really um, uh, let's say grease the wheels and make that flywheel uh, uh, turn even faster. So, what about Square? What do you what do you like about Square? Yeah, Square is, uh, it, it's, you know, they approach financial services with a very mission-driven uh, view of the world, and that's to increase economic empowerment. And the way Square started is really textbook disruption theory by Clay Christensen. You know, they started out with this dongle that you plugged into your iPhone and to accept credit cards, uh, going after the unbanked, really a completely ignored market. And then after capturing that, they, they started going up market. And now they have these beautiful uh, point of sale terminals for larger merchants, et cetera. And it's a company that has a very strong design and engineering culture and a product sensibility that's really reminiscent of Apple. And so the point of sale is used as a means of acquiring the customer. They sell the point of sale at a loss, the, the physical hardware, but then the unit economics uh, on top of that. So the payback period is extremely attractive. So uh, it's, it's really fantastic unit economics on top of that. So that's one part of the company. The other part is the, is the uh, that's called the seller ecosystem. And then of course they have the cash app, which is uh, an incredible uh, application for your phone that just has, they're sort of ninjas in uh, social media, viral marketing. Uh, uh, we, there's cash app Fridays on Twitter. Uh, and of course it enables very easy P2P payments. They have rewards through boosts. So you're walking by a store and they'll give you 10% off on, on a coffee or something like that. It's, it's really cool. It allows you to press a button and get your own card and customize the card and it's all free. And of course they're building more functionality into that also turning into a digital bank. So you can buy Bitcoin with no fees. You can buy fractional shares of stock with no fees, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, trading at hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can, you can buy 10 bucks worth of it if you want with, with no commissions. So I think it's a very powerful tool. And again, if they, if they execute well, it's, it's sort of a neo bank, right? In, in parlance, which is sort of this digital native bank. So we'll see what, how the company develops, but it's, it's really a very interesting approach to, to getting there. Yeah, the use cases and the functionality of the Cash App never cease to amaze me. It's like they're always coming out with another great use uh, yeah, for the Cash see, App. Yeah, John, and, and you see the, you know, the, the kind of talent that these companies uh, attract 
is another, I think, underappreciated point. If you're the best and brightest in the world, would you rather go work for an old school, you know, business that's barely growing and is barely relevant? Or would you rather work for a business that's in, in the zeitgeist that everybody's talking about that's exciting, that has a mission-driven culture? And I think the question answers itself. And in the case of Square, I was, I was amazed. I found, uh, I can't remember his name now, unfortunately, but I found this, this very talented designer on Twitter and he does just incredible animations. And he works for, for uh, Square because they do these amazing fluid uh, renderings and animations for their, their ads and things and, and, the, and the application itself. And, and so he's applying his talent to that, which I thought was really incredible. I love that you have highlighted design and that you, you made the um, similarity with Apple. On the morning show where, where I'm a co-host on Motley Fool Live, I've said that Square is the company that reminds me the most of Apple uh, because they excel at hardware, software, services, and design. So similar to what, to what you just said there. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> moving on to Twilio, uh, can you explain what Twilio does and why you're invested in Twilio? Sure. Uh, so in, in very simple terms, let's say you, you know, before Twilio existed, you wanted to use a computer to make a phone call or send a text message, right? That was hard, if not impossible to do. And so Twilio started out by making that extremely easy with just a few lines of code. So they turned telephone switches into software, very loosely speaking. But then they kept building on top of that they created this layer of programmable communications and now they're building on top of that. They kept asking the question, you know, how do we better serve our customer uh, developers? And so uh, developers wanted to send email. So Twilio went out and they acquired SendGrid, which was a company very similar to Twilio that was building programmable email. And then Twilio started seeing developers building these incredible applications using Twilio's uh, building blocks. So for example, there was a bank that was building an entire call center on top of Twilio. And so Twilio said, wow, that's, maybe there's an opportunity here. And they took some of their own building blocks and they built a higher level application, also fully programmable, which is a call center and that's called Flex. And, and so they'll continue to do that. They'll continue to identify use cases that customers are doing all this heavy lifting and try to make it easier and, and less and more frictionless for them to develop that. And so today Twilio calls itself uh, the, the leading customer engagement platform. And so the mission is to create this unbreakable uh, relationship with your customer. And so they recently acquired Segment, uh, deal is gonna close in, in Q4. And what Segment does is you have today all of these different interactions with your customers, right? There's phone calls, text messages on WhatsApp and iMessage and email. And perhaps the customer calls into your company and talks to uh, somebody in a call center. They also have website clicks uh, and all these things live in different systems and they're all siloed. Segment collects all that data together and puts it in the data warehouse for you in a way that allows you to uh, connect all that data and create a centralized, uh, unified profile of your customer. Now, this has been the holy grail of CRM, of, of customer relationship management for decades. And nobody's really been able to, to get that holy grail, put all this siloed information into one customer profile. So, you know, it's a very exciting acquisition and uh, we'll see how the company develops, but it just has this incredible momentum they keep hiring incredible talent. They keep acquiring incredible talent. So it's just a very exciting business to see uh, how, what they build. And if you, again, it's one of those where you look at what it's doing today and how big it could get. And it just, this just seems like there's a lot of uh, potential for the business to be much bigger. Awesome. You, uh, you also own two consumer facing entertainment technology businesses in Roku and Spotify. Please tell us why you like Roku and Spotify. Yeah, great question. I'm glad you put these two together because I think they have some similarities, you know, uh, linear TV. So just watching, you know, regular TV uh, is roughly a $70 billion industry in the US. That's just the ad supported side. And then there's another 80 billion from subscription revenues, and that's just in the US. 
Now, you know, years ago, I recall watching CBS's 60 Minutes and, you know, commercial break came and I had to sit through the golfer Phil Mickelson talk about Enbro, which is a drug for arthritis. And I was just like, oh man, this is, I don't want to sit through this. This is such a wasted opportunity. They could have shown me an ad for something cool that I actually care about, right? So I'm a big fan of targeted advertising because it allows businesses big and small to reach customers with relevant products. And this has been extremely successful for Google and Facebook. Of course, if you, I'm, I'm a big user of Instagram. And if you scroll through Instagram, you know, I, I get some really cool relevant ads of things that I, I actually bookmark some of the ads like, oh, I want to come back to this product later, which I probably never have done on in the old days of TV. So Roku is bringing this uh, programmability and targeting of advertising to television. And th the same way we talked about Square and how it sells the point of sale uh, terminal at a loss to acquire customers. Well, Roku does something similar. They sell at a very small margin, the Roku sticks that you can buy just about anywhere. And you plug that stick into your TV and now it's a Roku TV, or you can just go out and buy a Roku TV itself because they license the operating system. So about a third of all TVs sold in the US are natively Roku TVs. So now you have a Roku TV, right? What do you do with it? Well, the operating system, the user interface is much better than your cable box. And you can watch this enormous amount of content and it could be either ad supported, again, with much better ads than uh, ad experience than you've had before, or you can also subscribe to Netflix and Disney Plus and Roku gets a cut. And you can, do, you can do a mix of that. You can decide to watch something, a movie ad supported and then switch over to something that you pay for. Um, so you look at, you know, the company has this incredible management team. The, the metrics are just exploding all in the right direction. Uh, but it turns out that time spent on, on Roku is, is disproportionate relative to the amount of ad dollars that have gone to, uh, to Roku. So there's really literally a tsunami of, of dollars coming. And so uh, that's, that's, that's a very interesting dynamic. And we saw that previously happen, by the way, with mobile advertising, where time spent on mobile was very, very large and uh, ad dollars still hadn't, uh, haven't, hadn't, hadn't gone to mobile. And we, of course, that's been very successful for Facebook. Now, Spotify, similar dynamic in the sense that there's about $18 billion of terrestrial radio ad spend, again, in the US alone, uh, and Spotify can offer you a much better experience on the ad supported side there. Not only that, but there's going to be an explosion of ad inventory because of the rise of podcasts, which is not something that even existed in a terrestrial radio. But of course, Spotify is different in the sense that the ad supported part of the business is really just a funnel for their uh for their premium subscription business. They do extremely well converting ad supported users to premium users. And you know, it's a company that has this incredible management team. I'm a big fan of Daniel Ek, the, the founder and CEO. And he has this vision of creating an audio first company, like the largest audio first company on the planet. And so they've made a bunch of acquisitions, as you know, in, in, in podcasts and they're investing in original content. So in that sense, it's a little bit like Netflix in that the better content they have and the better user experience they have, uh, the more they please their members. And that improves engagement, it lowers churn uh, and lowers customer acquisition costs. So they're really building this incredible flywheel that could be much bigger in the future. Awesome. Um, so speaking of consumer facing businesses, uh, one of my favorite companies is Peloton. So I'm just wondering if you've ever looked at Peloton, thought about Peloton, and if so, what are your early thoughts? Could it potentially fit within your investing framework? Yeah, um, you know, I, I'll have more to say about Peloton uh, if we can do it next time. Uh, but what I'll say for now is we were having this discussion about Apple uh, and and Square. You know, Peloton is a great example of that because. The, the way, you know, Apple is really this phenomenal hardware company that differentiates it with phenomenal software. It's like premium hardware and premium software with a very superior integrated experience. And you can see that with Peloton as well. But, you know, I think we should, uh, sure. we should table this for a future discussion when, 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 when I can talk more about it.
Fair, fair enough. And I, and I look forward to having you on uh, again uh, very soon. Um, I'm going to try another one. Uh, what about Zoom? Have you looked at Zoom? Yeah. So funny story about Zoom is, uh, you know, I modeled Zoom uh, at the IPO. Uh, I, I thought it was a bargain because they were already profitable and you could uh, growing very fast. And I, you know, we have this account with a, with a, one of these large banks uh, as, a, as one of our brokers. And so I said, look, I'd love to buy, you know, a position in Zoom. I told them how much, et cetera. And they allocated us some Zoom, but it was like 100 shares, which was kind of them, but it doesn't really move the needle, right? So, uh, and, you know, Zoom, by the way, is, is a great example of, uh, of the problem with models. We were talking about, about this problem earlier. You know, I wrote a piece recently called Models Good and Bad, which is up on our blog, uh, if anybody wants to check it out. And it talks about this idea that uh, going back to AWS, AWS wouldn't have been created at all if Amazon had stuck to its models. Uh, and so that's an interesting story. So you know, back in March, by the way, back on Zoom, um, uh, before we knew the effects of the pandemic, my model uh, told me, and I, again, my, I know my model is wrong, but it told me that Zoom stock could deliver a mid single digit IRR into the future. Now that's not what we aim for, right? Now, of course, since then, the stock is up 4X. <laughs> and that's because my model showed Zoom doing $630 million for this whole year. And of course, they've done more than that last quarter. So now, obviously, you can't really have an investment thesis predicated on a pandemic accelerating your business. But the point really of the story is to be very careful of models in a complex world. So yeah, I, I still have to digest Zoomtopia, which just happened. And again, it's, it's a company where they, they are going to build a, um, they're probably going to build an incredible business. I do think the valuation is kind of bonkers, but um, you know, again, that's just based on, I, I updated my model and I still think it's a little bit bonkers, but we'll see what they build. Awesome, Marcelo. Marcelo, when do you sell a stock or when would you sell a stock out of the portfolio? Yeah, so, you know, selling, the way, the way I see it is you sell a stock when the company is no longer um, uh, competitively advantaged. So you're evaluating the business and you think, you know what, I don't, I don't think this company can grow as much as I thought it, would, it was going to grow. Um, there's too much competition. Um, you know, something in your thesis has, has broken. And then that's a very good reason to sell. Another good reason to sell perhaps is you find something better because everything is, uh, is sort of priced off of opportunity costs, right? Uh, it's very hard to, to do any sort of market timing, you know, forecasting, macro forecasting, all that stuff is, is uh, more voodoo than reality. And so it's, um, it's not something that I, that I use as a, as a tool for portfolio management. It's really more looking at the business fundamentals and then sort of sense checking my, my model. And I, and I may make moves in terms of, you know, overweighing something if it's cheap and underweighing something if it's, if I think the price is egregious, uh, perhaps even getting rid of it. I mean, if we, if we were back in a 2000 type scenario where everything is crazy overvalued, like probably there's this book called Bull by Maggie Mayhar. Like if you think, if you think we're in a bubble now, you should really read that book because <laughs> I mean, things, things were at, you know, insane levels uh, that, that we're not even, you know, anywhere close to, not to mention that the, the mark, markets today are much bigger than they used to be. Uh, and there's a lot of, it's a lot easier to scale a business. You've got cloud computing, which you didn't have back then. You had to invest tens of millions in servers just to get started. So there's an enormous amount of differences. Um, but that, that's sort of the short story on, on, I think, when to sell. Has there been a big change in your approach to investing during your time in the industry? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, really nothing short of a revolution, right? The, the way I, uh, I think, the way I see the world, the way I evaluate opportunities, I mean, everything has changed completely. I started out in my career playing this very rigid game 
a very technical game of value investing based on what I learned studying Ben Graham and, and Buffett. Um, and, you know, wh what I learned over the years is that I've had to unlearn so many things. Maybe I shouldn't have put so much weight in them in the first place. So I think there's a lot of wisdom behind this phrase, strong opinions loosely held. You know, so the reality is that the world is really not based on a rigid set of rules. It's really a complex adaptive system in which the rules are constantly changing. And if you don't adapt, you die. Uh, and, and, and by the way, one example of this is the internet has really brought to the fore this idea of the zero marginal cost business, which is something that never existed before. So it sort of, it blew people's minds that you could have a business that lost money, but grew very fast. And that is part of the software as a service business model that I think is still misunderstood. Uh, so because the world is so dynamic, it means literally having to change your mind very often. Uh, and if you don't change your mind, how else are you going to adapt, right? So, you know, when I find a better way to think, when I discover better, better tools, and, and I can throw out an old way of doing things, it just makes me happy because it means I'm adapting. So it's really this endless process and you really have to stay at it and, and make an effort to, to just really keep an open mind. Yeah. And maybe uh, the last question, we have about two minutes left. Um, what is the biggest lesson you think you've learned over the years as an investor? Well, in two minutes, uh, yeah. there's so many, but probably the single biggest one is this idea we just talked about, which is evolving your mind and your methods and finding a style of investing that really uh, suits your personality and the way you see the world. And, but then being very flexible in how you see the world as well. You know, the, um, the way I invest today, I like the way I invest today much more than I did even three years ago. And I really hope that three years from now, I can say the same thing about the way I invest today. So yeah, the biggest lesson is really this idea of perpetual beta and having uh, strong opinions loosely held, open mind. Like Jeff Bezos says, it's always day one. I love that, Marcelo. You know, if, 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 if markets and economies are complex adaptive systems, like you said, and like I believe, then perpetual beta and adap adapt uh, adaptability is, is maybe the greatest source of competitive advantage there is, not only for the businesses that we invest in, but for uh, us as investors and as business analysts. So Marcelo, thank you so much. This has been like mind blowing. I loved it. I'm gonna have you back again. Uh, and on behalf of myself and The Motley Fool, we are forever grateful. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah.